Good morning. Good to have you with us again uh, one last time. We are finishing up Revelation today. I was going to take two services and do this, but we're going to do it in one, one final look. We uh, Last couple of weeks we've been looking at the reality of heaven. You know, that's our greatest encouragement, being with Christ in heaven for all eternity, being with the Lord, uh, and just to having the opportunity to experience now just a little bit of that, a taste of that, you know, as in our walk with the Lord. And so uh, as we finish Revelation, the Lord has some important things to say to us, the church, to the seven churches, before he wraps up this book. Now remember, Revelation is bringing together everything that is in the Word of God, from Genesis all the way to Revelation. And so what we see here is really culminating, bringing together, synthesizing all that the Scriptures talk about. And so we see final uh, three final thoughts here, and that's what I want to look at this morning. Three final takeaways that we can embrace, take to our hearts, and as we bring Revelation into our life, how we live for the Lord, because this glimpse, this view of heaven is intended to, to help us now to walk with the Lord. So let's look at those. I want to read the text first so we can see that. So we're in Revelation chapter 22. I'm going to begin in verse 6. And he said to me, these words are trustworthy and true. And the Lord, the God of the spirits of the prophets, has sent his angel to show his servants what must soon take place. And behold, I am coming soon. Blessed is the one who keeps the word of the prophecy of this book. I, John, am the one who heard and saw these things. And when I heard them and saw them, I fell down at the feet of the angel who showed them to me. But he said to me, you must not do that. I am a fellow servant with you and your brothers, the prophets, and with those who keep the words of this book. Worship God. And he said to me, do not seal up the words of the prophecy of this book. For the time is near. Let the evildoer still do evil, and the filthy still be filthy, and the righteous still do right, and the holy still be holy. Behold, I am coming soon, bringing my recompense with me to repay each one for what he has done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end. Blessed are those who wash their robes so that they might have the right to the tree of life that they may enter the city by the gates. Outside are the dogs and the sorcerers and the sexually immoral, the murderers and the idolaters and everyone who loves and practices falsehood. I, Jesus, have sent my angel to testify to you about these things for the churches. I am the root and the descendant of David, the bright morning star. The spirit and the bride say, come, and let the one who hears say, come, and let the one who is thirsty come. Let the one who desires to take the water of life without prize, price. I warn everyone who hears the words of the prophecy of this book, if anyone adds to them, God will add to him the plagues described in this book. And if anyone takes away from the words of the book of this prophecy, God will take away his share in the tree of life and in the holy city which are described in this book. He who testifies to these things says, Surely I am coming soon. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. And the grace of the Lord Jesus be with all. Amen. As we, as we finish up here, this book of Revelation, it's so important to the daily walk of the believer. It gives us a glimpse of, of God's eternal plan. It gives us hope and certainty. It also gives us uh, motivation to serve him well to be a, a light in a dark world, to, to identify our lives with Jesus Christ, to let others see him. Let's, let's look at the final reminders here of Revelation to us that John records here in this book. The first thing that we see, there are, there are three takeaways for us, I believe, um, as we finish this up. Number one is we are to stand firm on the word of God. Every believer is to stand firm on God's word. We see it here in verse 6. And he said to me, uh, the angel was speaking, he said these words, the words of God that he's conveying, these words are trustworthy and true. You know, we accept the word of God simply by faith. We take God at his word, we believe what he has written, what he has laid down before us uh, through the prophets, through the apostles. God simply makes a, de a declarative statement. The words of God contained in the scriptures are true 
They are trustworthy. You can trust them with your life. We've seen in the book of Revelation, martyrs give their life because they have deemed the words of Scripture worthy to live by. They have deemed, they have uh, come to the, to the uh, commitment that Jesus Christ is worthy to live for and to die for. We're to stand firm on God's Word. You can trust God's Word. In our culture, God's Word is being turned upside down. God's Word is being rejected. It's going to take, it's going to take faith in your life to stand on God's Word, to live according to God's Word, to be obedient to God's Word. It will be, uh, it'll be a matter of faith in your life. Do you believe that God's Word is true and true for your life? That's the challenge of Revelation. We also see in, in verse 6, and we see in verse 9, and the Lord, the God, the spirits of all prophets, and Numbers, he says, he's the God of the spirits of all flesh. Here he's focusing in on the prophets because he's focusing in here on the Word of God, his words. He sends his angels to show his servants. We see that in verse in verse 6. Also, we see in verse 9, um, we're, to, we're to keep the words of this book I am a fellow servant, he says. What we see here, the Word of God, we're to stand firm on the Word of God. It is the basis for, for how, it is the basis for why we serve the Lord. The angel here, the believers in Christ, we are servants of Jesus Christ. How we serve him is based upon what he's revealed in his Word, his truth. The reason that we serve, the manner in which we serve, the way in which we serve, why we serve, the motivation behind our service Everything that dis- defines and reveals to us the heart of a servant comes from the Word of God. We serve because of what we learn from God's Word. If I put my faith and trust in His Word and in Him, then I will serve Him. I will serve Him faithfully. I will be a servant as He was a servant for me, to me, for us, to us. We will also carry on that that promise, the Word of God that is reliable, it'll, we'll understand that as we stand firm on it, we, we, we see it as, as our source, our foundation to help us to know how to serve God and how to do it well. God wants us to serve Him with our life. How we do that is in the Word of God. If you want to be a servant of the Lord, you want to do it well, as He's called you to do, you must be a student of God's Word. The angel here, those here, considered themselves first and foremost servants of God. It was based upon the truth of God's word and who he was. Now as we continue, we see this as well. Verse 18 and 19. I warn everyone who hears the words of the prophecy. Well, let's look at uh, verse, let's go back to verse 7. I'm coming soon. Blessed is the one who keeps the words of the prophecy of this book. The word of God is to be kept. We we stand firm on God's word. It's to be kept. We are to obey God's word. We're to follow through on God's word. We're to be obedient to his word. God revealed his truth to us, his revelation to us, that we might act on that, live according to that, follow through in our life according to his word. Verse 18, he, he gives us a warning. To those, to everyone who hears the word of God, the words of the prophecy here of Revelation, the prophecies of Revelation, he says, if we add to the word of God or take away from the word of God, God will get, will add to them the plagues of the word of this book. And ultimately, uh, if we take away from the word of God, then what will be revealed at the end of that verse, God will take away his share of the tree of life. When we simply refuse to live according to God's word, we're revealing we're not a child of God. And ultimately, all the, all the pain that comes from the prophecies in the wrath of God against, against sin will be, will be poured out against us. And so we're not to add to God's Word. We're not to build traditions on God's Word. We're not to, we're not to build our own standards on God's Word and elevate our standards to the, to the, to the same priority and, and truth as the Word of God. The Word of God supersedes everything in our life, our truth, our cultural mores, all of those things. We're not to take away from the Word of God. We're not, we're not to, uh, we're not to uh, disrespect, to disregard the Word of God. You know, we might just take a literal view of this and say we're not to add to God's Word. We're not to add truth. We're not to take away or refuse to teach or to look at but also is true the principle here in this is, is simply we're, we are to honor all of God's word in our life. We're to honor it. 
uh, we're to keep it, we're to honor it. Not to add to it our own opinions, not to take away from God's word or, or refuse to look at certain por portions of scripture or refuse to read certain parts of, parts of scripture, come to it like we go to a mall and shop. I'll shop in, in this store and I'll shop in this store. I don't, I don't like going here. I don't like, I don't like going shopping for clothes and so I don't go to that store. We're to, we're to take in the whole counsel of the word of God. It's to be added into our life. It's to be reflected in our life. And when we don't desire the whole counsel of the word of God, we're in trouble of, of, of not taking heed to the whole word of God. We are to, we are to keep God's word. We're to honor God's word. We'll be obedient to God's word. We're to honor all of his word. Honor its truth. Don't add to it. Don't take away from it. Don't disregard God's word in your life. It's a danger. It is a danger because it reveals as it becomes a pattern in one's life that maybe what's missing simply is, is your, your relationship with Jesus Christ. It's not about going to church. It's not about doing Christian things. It's about honoring his word in our life. Now, another thing that we see here as we continue is we see in verse 8 and 9, um, John says, when I, heard, when, I, when I heard all all of these things in Revelation, we see it again. He's, this isn't the first time. He says, I fell down to worship at the feet of the angel. He, he, just, he was filled with worship, but he directed his worship to the wrong object. The angel, the angel was the messenger of Christ, the messenger of God. He is in awe of what this angel has communicated, and he, he misdirects his worship. You need to be careful we don't do that, because our worship is to go to Christ only, to God the Father only through Christ. And the angel clearly says, and, and importantly says, don't worship me. I'm simply a fellow servant with you, uh, with your brothers, the prophets, with those who keep the words of this book. Worship God. The Word of God, we're to stand firm, firm on it. Why? Because the Word of God is a catalyst for worship. The Word of God leads my heart to worship Him. When I read God's Word and I encounter Christ, and I encounter God, when I encounter His faithfulness and His grace, His mercy, His attributes, His, His patience with me, it leads me, it leads us, the believer, to worship. And worship is just simply exalting God. And reminding ourselves that our life is all about him. And he has poured into our life and he is doing in my life what we cannot do ourselves. That leads us to worship and to praise and to adoration, to submission, to yield to, yield to him. And so he says at the end of verse 10, verse 9, worship God. When you're in the word of God, it leads you to worship. If you find that you simply are never excited about God, you're bored with God, you're bored with church, you're bored with, with the Word, you've not encountered the God of the Bible. You've not immersed yourself in the Word of God. We are to stand firm, immerse ourselves in the Word of God. And then we see in verse 10, And he said to me, Do not seal up the words of this prophecy. In Daniel, he said to Daniel, because uh, Revelation is built upon Daniel and many of the Old Testament prophets, he said to Daniel, seal up the words of this prophet, this book, because it's not, a, it's not yet to happen. But now it is here in Revelation. And he says, do not seal up the words of the prophecy of this book, for the time is near. The word of God reminds us that it is going to be fulfilled. God's word is true. It's trustworthy. It's true. And he will fulfill every promise he has ever written, whether it's prophetic whether it's personal, whether it's relational, whether it's national to Israel, to us, it doesn't matter. God will fulfill his every promise. When you're in the word of God, it simply reminds you all the time that that's true. It's a matter of faith. Do you believe that God's word will come to pass? That the promises, the truth, the blessings of God's word will come to pass? If you are convinced of that, if, if your faith in Christ is genuine and true, it leads you to that place of understanding that the Word of God is true, and His desire is to grab a hold of your life and point you to Christ so that you and I will live for Jesus Christ. We're to stand firm on the Word of God. Revelation reminds us of that, teaches us that, shows us that. The prophecy is based upon the Word of God. The response of believers is because of the truth of the Word of God. We must stand firm on the Word. The second thing that we see here, another takeaway here in Revelation, is we're to live in light of his coming. He's coming again. It's certain. Verse 7. Behold, I am coming soon. We see in verse 12. 
Behold, I am coming soon. We see in verse 20, surely, surely I am coming soon. We see here, it is certain Jesus Christ lays it before us. He is coming again. Uh, we see also in, in verse 6, he sent his angel to show his servants what must soon take place. We see that. Verse 10, the time is near. You know, God's calendar, his timetable is vastly different than ours. He is eternal. We know one day is as a thousand years, but a thousand years is as one day. It's been, it's been two days plus since he's laid this before us. That's not, that's not something just to jest at. It's true. God's timetable is different than ours. And you know what? He reminds us time is short. When we see the changes in our world and the changes in our culture, you can be sure that the Lord's return will happen at any time. And all these things that we have seen in Revelation will unfold. We are to live in light of His coming. He's coming again, folks. He's coming again. We will stand before Him. We will be accountable as all of Revelation shows us. All of us will. We will all, we will all hear His voice and be resurrected to either life or to eternal separation. God's Word makes that very clear as we encounter this book and the truth, truth of it. Look at, look at verse 7. Behold, I'm coming soon. Blessed is the one who keeps the words of the prophecy of this book. The words of the prophecy, the focus here is the, is the prophetic word that we've seen here in Revelation. When we, when we live in view of his second coming, it is, it is motivation for following the word of God. Jesus Christ is coming again. It is motivation that we honor his word, we keep his word, we follow his word. Jesus Christ came, but when he came, he says, I have, I have completed, I have finished, I have done the will of my Father. Every word that the, my Father has spoken into my life, I have honored, I have obeyed, I have completed. And Jesus now helps you and he helps me to have that same desire, that when we finish our life, we can say, Lord Jesus, my Heavenly Father, I have done what you have asked me to do. I have obeyed you, followed you, accomplished your will in my life. That's, that's what Jesus wants to accomplish in your life and mine. The Word of God is motivation. The second coming of the Lord, which is certain and true, is to be motivation in our life uh, to follow His Word. That is, that is so key. And so the motivation that comes is from His Word. The Word tells us and reminds us, Jesus is coming again. How beautiful that is. We're to live in light of his coming. Verse 12, I'm coming soon. I'm bringing my recompense with me to repay each one for what he's done. I'm the alpha, I'm the omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end. What I said, it stands upon my character. You can trust me. I am the beginning and the end. I will fulfill all that I have said. And he says in verse 12, you know, when I come back, and we've talked about this, I'm going to bring my reward. My recompense, big word, my reward. I'm going to reward. So what he's done is he's finished a chronological flow here in Revelation. As we pick up verse 6, he's now speaking again to, to the churches, directly to them. He's speaking to us, his church, and he's reminding us he's coming again. He's going to bring his reward. We've already seen that here in Revelation. But now he's reminding us that as he's now steps back and he begins to speak to the churches, not, not, a, not the prophecy, not the chronological flow, but simply speaking to their hearts once again. He reminds us that what we've seen in Revelation, it hasn't happened yet. It's going to come, and it is to be a motivation in my life. And God, God is going to come. He's going to reward and bless you with his blessing for all eternity. He calls you and I to walk faithfully in obedience. Just remember, be encouraged. I know it's hard to stay faithful. I know it's hard to stay motivated every day. I know it's hard to do the right thing all the time. It's easy to do the wrong thing. It's hard to do the right thing. It's hard to live by faith, to walk by faith, and not by sight, and not by feelings, and not by emotions. We're called to keep our eyes focused on Jesus Christ. And just remember, the Lord has promised to, to every genuine child of God, He will reward. That reward will be uh, beyond comprehension for all eternity, the goodness, the blessing of God into your life, into, into your reality for all eternity for Jesus Christ will make, will make the hardships and the adversities of this life worth it all. Reward? It's coming. 
I want you to not forget that. Verse 20, and he testifies to these things. Surely I am coming, I'm coming soon. That's what he says. I am coming soon. And he says, amen, come Lord Jesus. Amen simply means uh, so be it. Lord, that's what I want to take place. But amen, I want, Lord, I, I want you to come. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. It is, it is the reward of, Jesus, of his coming that motivates us. But, but the second coming of Jesus Christ is to fill you and I with, with anticipation of what Jesus Christ is going to do. That's what we see here. It's, it's to fill us with a, a perspective. It's to give us a perspective that is eternal. It's, it's larger than the problems that we face. It's larger than the challenges that we face. It's larger than, than the issues that we face in life. It reminds us that the Lord is walking ahead of us, before us. He knows our every step. He knows the future. He has a future for you and I. Keep our eyes on Him. Keep, keep that perspective of faith that we are serving Him because of what He's done for us in the past and what He's prepared for us in the future. What a, what a beautiful reminder. It touches my heart. It is strength in my life. It keeps me faithful to the Lord. God wants that for you and I. That's what he wants. The second coming of the Lord, it just fills us. It fills me with anticipation, with, with just a reality. Uh, it's a perspective. I don't live, you and I don't live just in the here and now. There is a day coming. And so that's a takeaway. God is coming back. Jesus Christ is coming back. Be ready, be hopeful, anticipate, be longing, be yearning for that. If I am, and if you do, it'll change how we live our life, really, every day and every moment. Accountability and the promise of reward will stay before all that I do, and I will be a testimony for Christ. This leads us to the, to the last piece that we see here. We're to, the, the third takeaway is we're to let the gospel of Jesus Christ transform our life. Revelation is about many things. We think it's about wrath. We think it's about judgment. God does lay before us his final wrath and judgment against sin. But throughout the book of Revelation, we see the gospel. We see good news because the gospel simply is God's good news to us. God's good news is available in everything that unfolds because he's always giving you and I opportunity to do the right thing, to come to him by faith, to walk by faith. And so we need to let the gospel, we need to let the good news of revelation of, of faith in Christ change us, transform us, be strength in our life. First thing that we see here is it is power. It's power in our life. Look at verse 14. Blessed are those who wash their robes. Blessed are those who wash their robes. That is so important. Um, it, it, it signifies two things. We have, we have two examples here in the book of Revelation. In chapter 7, Verse 14, we see this. Who are those? The question is asked, who are those coming out of the tribulation? And the answer is, these are the ones, these are the ones who are coming out of the tribulation. They have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Chapter 7, verse 14. Those who have washed their robes are those who have received Jesus Christ, who have accepted Jesus Christ as Savior, who identify with Jesus Christ as Savior. Now they are, their lives are being offered up, they are being martyred. And then we see in chapter 3 of Revelation, verse 4, these words. There are, there are a few names in Sardis, that's one of the church, seven churches, people who have not soiled their garments. They will walk with me in white, for they are worthy. They've made a choice not to be corrupted by this world. That's sanctification. It's being, it's being set apart, choosing to be set apart to Jesus Christ, not, not to play with the things in this world, be identified with the things in this world, be drawn to the things in this world. Not to be drawn to the sin that it offers and the pleasures that it offers, but to say, no, I'm a follower of Jesus Christ. I will not let this world corrupt my testimony, taint my walk with Jesus Christ. I will remain pure before the Lord. That's what's taking place here. And so when we see in verse 14, blessed are those who wash their robes, it's those who have experienced the washing of Jesus Christ and those who have also chosen to, to set their lives apart to Jesus Christ. As Christ set them apart at the gospel, they have chosen to, to set themselves apart in faithfulness to the Lord. Blessed are you and I who make that same choice. 
And so the gospel touches our lives. That's what it does. It becomes power in our lives. It gives us the ability to, to be set apart to Jesus Christ, to be overcomers. We are to be overcomers. That's one of the messages of Revelation. We can win the victory. You can do that. We see also that, it, that the gospel, it's a matter of life and death, verse 14 and 15. Blessed are those who wash their robes so they may have the right to the tree of life. They may enter the city by the gates. That's those who know Christ. Outside are the dogs and the sorcerers, the sexually immoral, immoral, murderers, idolaters, everyone who loves and practices falsehood. Revelation chapter 21 here, verse 8. For the, the cowardly, the faithless, so there's a list here. Their portion will be in the lake of fire. This is These, these in verse uh, 15 are referring to those who are in the lake of fire. They're not on the earth. He knew heaven and new earth. They're not somehow outside of Jerusalem and, and can maybe have access into heaven? No, they are all in the lake of fire. We see that in, in chapter 21, verse 8. Chapter 21, verse 7, nothing unclean will ever enter it. Nothing, no sinner can ever leave the lake of fire and come in and towards heaven. It just cannot happen. Verse chapter 22, verse 3, nothing there will be accursed. What we see here is the gospel is a matter of life and death. There is a clear separation because in verse 14, those who have washed their robes and had their robes washed, both are true. They will have the right to the tree of life to be able to live in the city, come into the city, go out of the city. That's what's going to take place. Daniel chapter 12, verse 10, upon which Revelation is built. Many shall purify themselves, make themselves white and be refined, but the wicked shall act wickedly. And none of the wicked shall understand, and those who are wise shall understand. We see here in verse 11, of this chapter, let the evil doer still do evil, and the filthy still be filthy, and the righteous still do right, and the holy still be holy. God just says, let the patterns of life continue. The time is near. Let, let people continue to make their choices for which they will be accountable. In God's sovereign plan, let them continue to do what they've chosen to do. But God in his grace continues to woo us, to draw us to him. Revelation is filled with the gospel. He gives us a choice. He gives us an opportunity. God's grace is here. It's a matter of life and death. It's power in our life. We're able to overcome, to wash our robes, to be right with God, to walk right with God. It's also a matter, the gospel is a reminder to us. Every day that we live and everywhere we go, we simply just see people and they need the Lord. They need the Lord. Just like you needed the Lord. Like maybe you need the Lord as you're listening. How important that is. It is also very true of verse 16 and 17. It's to be the message of the church. The Spirit, Holy Spirit, and the bride, that's the church, that's the believers, say, come. In unity, we say, come. And let the one who, is, who hears say, come. We have heard. We're to say, come. That's to be the message of our life. The gospel is to transform us. It's to become is to become the message of our life. That's why we're called to be Christians, to amplify, uh, to model, to live out, to, to communicate and to share the good news of Jesus Christ. People are, are sinners. People need the provision of a Savior. They need what only Jesus Christ can give. We're to look to share that. That's to be the message of the church. If you are a child of God, you will care about that. You will be active in that because God, by his spirit, puts that in your heart. That's what's happening here. The church, as led by the spirit of God, is, is proclaiming this message. Come, come to Jesus Christ. Whosoever shall call upon the name of our Lord Jesus Christ shall be saved. We're to live that message consistently or to share that message consistently how important that is how important that is and it is it is the reality of grace revelation is all about grace the gospel of jesus christ if it transforms your life it'll always take you back to grace it will remind you every day you need god's grace <clears throat> it'll remind you every day that we are to be people of god's grace <clears throat> verse 17 let the one who is thirsty come let the one who desires to take the water of life without price <coughs> excuse me 
We are called here to be people of grace. Look at verse 21. And the grace of the Lord Jesus be with all. Amen. The mark of a believer is to be a grace-filled individual. This is how all people will know that you and I are disciples of Jesus Christ. It's the love of Christ in us. The love of Christ amplifies the grace of God. You and I are to be people of grace. That's what we're called to be. We're to share. Whoever is thirsty, whoever desires, it doesn't matter their background. It doesn't matter the scars in their life. It doesn't matter how evil they are. It doesn't matter what they've done to you or to me. It doesn't matter whether we think they deserve it or not. When we look at what Jesus Christ has done for us, what he's done for you in your own life, how can we not but view others through the lens of grace? You and I, we, we don't deserve salvation. We don't deserve the riches of the blessings of this book. We don't deserve it. We don't deserve it. God has richly blessed us with this through faith. We're going to be people of grace. The gospel of revelation, the gospel of the word of God is to transform your life. You and I are to be people of grace. We're to be a mouthpiece for the Lord. You and I need to take that away from the book of Revelation. We are to be ambassadors for Jesus Christ. We are to be a living letter to amplify the message of Jesus Christ in our life, the way we talk and the way we live. How important that is. God's Word, we're to stand firm on God's Word. We're to, we're to live in light of His coming. He's coming back again. And we're to let the gospel of Jesus Christ transform our, our lives. I pray that you are burdened for people who need the Lord. If you are not, you and I, if we're not standing on God's word, if we're not even thinking about his second coming, about him coming again and what that means for our life, if we have no passion to share, our, to share Christ with people, you and I, we need to repent and call it sin because that's what it is. We need to ask God to make our heart tender again towards His Word, tender towards who He is and what He's called us to do, tender towards people who need the Lord. That's the greatest need of the church is for God to make our hearts tender, to touch our hearts, to fill it with His love and His grace, to be people of mercy. That's what God's called us to do. People of grace, people of grace, people of grace. Ephesians chapter 2 reminds us that this life of grace can be ours. By grace we're saved. We're saved through faith. It's not of works. It is God's grace that saved you and I in the first place. It's where it started. And if it's genuine, then what started there will blossom, and the fruit of that salvation will blossom in your life. It'll just pour through your life, and people will see that. Because Christ, when He touches a life, he changes a life. Lord, change me. Lord, fill me with your grace. Make me an instrument of your grace. This testimony of grace, it can be yours. Paul writes these words, and the grace of our Lord, it overflowed for me, for me, with the faith and the love that are in Jesus Christ. It's given me the ability to, to place my faith in Christ. It's filled my heart with a love for Jesus Christ. Paul says that's my testimony. That can be your testimony. That can be, that can be yours right now. That grace-filled testimony, that can be yours. I want to encourage you with that. The reality of this grace in your life, it can be yours. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Every believer is to, is to grab a hold of this heartbeat right now. The grace of God, the love of God, the, the fellowship that the Spirit of God brings into our life to commune with God himself. And, and the impact and the result of that relationship and that communion, God says that reality is to be yours is and will be yours and it can be yours in Jesus Christ. It involves intimacy. This intimacy can be yours as well. May grace and peace be multiplied to you, overflow to you in the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. The knowledge of God isn't isn't it's not filling the blank Bible studies. It's not it's not doing Bible study every week. It's not sitting down and just and just uh uh, being able to regurgitate the Word of God and, 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 to, and even take uh, scriptures that we've learned and just spit them out. 
No, this is an intimacy. This is, I know Christ. I know the Lord. I, I know what it feels like to, to hear the Lord press on my heart. I know what it feels like for the Lord to use the Spirit to move my heart, to move me with com conviction or to move me with compassion, to move me to do the right thing, to correct a wrong, whatever it might be. The intimacy here is one of relationship. I know Christ. I'm learning more about Him. His, his character is becoming my character. He is, I am being conformed. I'm being molded every day more so that I look, my character, my life looks more like what Christ wants it to look like. This, it's intimacy. It's taking time to spend time with Christ, to get to know Him, to know what His heart is for me, to understand that men and women in the Bible are real men and women, to get to know those men and those women, to understand their walk of faith, and the challenges that they faced and the victories that God gave them, and understand that, that those victories and can be my victories, and the challenges that they faced are like challenges I faced, and God can help me. And intimacy brings me to that place of understanding those things. Grace gives us the ability to have confidence, to have power in that relationship. Let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace, that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. We are a needy people. I am a needy people. And when I draw near, when you draw near, when you choose, when we choose in faith to draw near to Christ, because everything is pulling us. We're always being pulled in other directions. But when we draw, when we, when we uh, respond first to the pull of Christ in our life, it always draws us to his heart. It changes us. It fills us with confidence. It fills us with power. I watch too many believers who have no confidence and who have no power, who, who aren't drawn to Christ, who, who don't have testimony in Christ, who aren't strong in their in their walk with Jesus Christ because they're not drawn to him in intimacy and in power. Grace gives us a satisfaction that only God can produce. Nothing else can do that. God is able to make all grace abound to you so that having all sufficiency in all things at all times you may abound in every good work. Grace satisfies. Grace is satisfaction. It is God's greatest resource into our life it is his grace every moment and every day. No matter what we face in the hardships of this life, we're aliens on this earth. We don't belong to this earth. We face temptations. We face the hardship of God's testing in our life to, to refine us, to help us be more like Christ. In all of that, God has given us all that we need in grace to enable us, to help us, to enrich us, to bless us here and now. That's the promise. Revelation is about God's Word. It is about the fact that Jesus Christ has a sovereign program and plan. He's coming back again. It's, it's a reminder to us ultimately of the gospel, of, of the good news of Jesus Christ. Revelation is a reminder to us that we need to be people of grace. Be a, be a person of grace. Let these elements of grace be a part of your testimony in your life. It'll change you. I guarantee it. It's God's guarantee to your life. To mine as well. Let's give this commitment to the Lord. Let's yield to the Lord in this manner, in this way, that we might be overcomers, that we might be people of faith, that we might be ambassadors for Christ, that God might be able to use us, that He might be able to one day say, Well done, thou good and faithful servant. I am coming soon. Amen. Say it with me. Come, Lord Jesus. The grace of the Lord Jesus be with you all. And all God's people said at the end of that verse, and together, amen. May that be your prayer, your hope, your commitment, your satisfaction, your transformation, the reality of faith in Christ. May this be yours, that grace, I pray. Thanks for joining with us through this series in Revelation. I pray it's been helpful to you. We will come back together online when we start a new series and uh, continue to study God's Word, to grow, draw your heart to Jesus Christ in faith. Thanks again for joining with us. We'll see you again in the future.